Okay, year nine, welcome to today's lesson. So, um, last week, what I asked you to do was start thinking about the scientific method. And to really get you thinking about this, I asked you to do a flowchart much like this, okay? Now, the whole idea about this was to understand that any scientific theory is only as good as the evidence which supports it. And one of the things we sort of accept in science is we don't have proof, really, of very much in science. All we have is very, very strong evidence. So we believe something is true because we've got lots and lots of evidence that points to that. So a good example is evolution. Okay, we believe evolution is, or the theory of evolution is a good one because the evidence supports it. Okay, there is the fossil evidence, okay, which seems to show how one species has evolved from earlier species. And there is now more recently DNA um, sequencing that can show us that, you know, some animals are very closely related to each other, not only by the way they look, but also by their DNA. And so we can track it through time like that, okay? So, Today what we're going to do though is we're going to think about how we actually do an experiment in order to gain this evidence to, to produce a theory. So I'm going to talk you through one example and then I'm going to give you uh, a couple of ideas. Okay, so first one uh, would be an example of the atom. Now you studied atoms in year eight, so but maybe not in this much detail. So I'm not going to go into too much about these right now, but our idea of what an atom was has changed quite radically over the last few years. So, we started in 1803 with John Dalton, okay, and he proposed that an atom was a solid sphere, coming from the Greek word atomis, which means indivisible, can't be divided. And why did he think an atom was the smallest unit of any substance? Um, well, he did, he did certain experiments. So, for example, he did experiments about pressure and particles, and his model was that particles were solid balls. So you could have one that was gold, like this, or then you'd have another one which was, say, I don't know, carbon, might be a different colour, but an atom was just a solid ball like that. Then we found some new evidence. So about 100 years later, so you can see there in 1904, okay, so at the beginning of the last century, a guy called J.J. Thompson discovered that atoms actually have a negative charge. Okay, these little particles existed within atoms. He called them electrons, and he found those by, again, doing an experiment. Okay, he used some electricity, and he found that these little charges move. And so he revised the model. He said, ah, actually, you know, an atom, it is a solid ball. Yeah, that part's right. So there's your solid ball. But that solid ball has a positive charge. And intermixed with that are these lots of little negative charges just dotted around randomly. Okay, and that makes it neutral overall. Okay, now he called this the plum pudding model of the atom because he said, well, the solid part of the atom is like the sponge. And then the electrons dotted randomly throughout it are like plums in a plum pudding. So he said this is the, called the plum pudding model. And that's actually the name given to it in GCSE. It's the plum pudding model. Okay. And again, he did an experiment that discovered electrons. And so he had to work that in. Then our ideas changed again. A guy called Ernest Rutherford just a few years later said, uh, actually, no, I think the atom looks more like this. There's a positively charged nucleus. And then there's like electrons kind of moving around it like that, okay? And again, Rutherford did an experiment and his con basically what he found from his experiment led him to this conclusion. Then just a couple of years later, it changed again. This guy called Niels Bohr said, okay, yeah, okay. Positive nucleus, electrons going round, but those electrons are in distinct energy levels not just floating randomly around, like Ernest Rutherford said, but in very distinct levels. And again, some experiments, some new evidence came to light, which said, okay, this is a better model. And then finally, the most recent model, which, was, which came up in 1926, was a guy called Erding Schrodinger, 
and um, there was another person involved, Heisenberg, and what they said was this. Electrons are found in shells, but because of something about them, you can never know with 100% certainty where they'll be. So we have what we call probability orbits, where they're most likely to be, but we can never know 100% sure where they are. Okay, And this, basically, is the newest idea of the atom, which we think is probably the closest because it fits the experiments. So, all right, basically, what we do is we come up with new models, these new ideas, based on our experimental evidence. Okay, so how do we get the experiment? Well, firstly, we need to write these three things down. I'm going to explain these to you. Okay, so just quickly pause the video and write independent variable, dependent variable, and control variable. Okay, and we're going to go through what they mean. Okay, welcome back. So, this is essentially what these actually mean. So, the independent variable is in an experiment the thing you deliberately change to see what will happen. Okay, so in an experiment, we might have an idea that, say, uh, I don't know, running in certain shoes can make you run faster. Okay, so what you would maybe try is trainers and then some smart shoes and then flip flops. Okay. That is the thing that you deliberately change, okay? So you would need to try different types of shoes and see how that affects your result. So the dependent variable, that's the outcome that you measure. So how would you measure this, okay? So maybe you would measure how fast someone can run 100 meters in these different shoe types, okay? To see if there was a change. So that would give you Changing this causes this, okay? So, um, changing the shoe type will change the speed at which you can run, okay? However, you need to consider one other thing, control variables. These are the things you keep the same in order to ensure your results are valid. Now, let's just say if you put Usain Bolt in a pair of really, really smart shoes, he would probably still be able to run faster than me in a pair of trainers, okay? So that wouldn't be a fair test, okay? And so it's really, really important that the control variables are exactly what they sound like, things that you control to ensure your results are valid. So if you were going to do this experiment, you would have to use the same runner. So you, let's just say we stick with Usain Bolt. We put Usain Bolt in a pair of trainers and get him for 100 meters. Then we do the same thing in a pair of smart shoes, a pair of wellies, a pair of sandals. So the control variable in this case is the person we have running, which would be Usain Bolt. We could also make sure that there is no wind, okay, because there could be air resistance. So we'd run it on a calm day. So as he was running, there'd be no wind pushing him back. Um, we could make sure he wears the same clothes throughout his runs. So uh, they don't sort of, if he's wearing his like running clothes in one, but then a suit in another, that could also affect his results. So there are lots of things that you need to control. Okay, so that is what I mean by an independent variable, a dependent variable, and a control variable. These are absolutely vital for understanding your experiments in year 10. So. What I would like you to do is this. I'd like you to write down essentially the definition of what these are. And then in the assignment, there is a video link that gives you a similar example to what I just showed you. I'd like you to watch that, please. And then there are two worksheets that I would like to work through. Each one should take you about 10 minutes. Okay. So I am just going to go through one other thing with you before I get you to do the worksheets, though. So, the other work part of the worksheet talks about how we can read data. Okay, so let's just say we've got our results. Okay, now we always have the independent variable along the bottom and the dependent variable going up the side. And we call this the x axis. And the way I remember it is it goes across because x is across, 
That's why I remember it. And this is the y-axis. Okay, so x-axis, y-axis. So the independent variable, the thing we deliberately change, unless you're specifically told otherwise, always goes on the x-axis. So maybe you could just very quickly draw a graph like that and just explain that. Okay, so pause the video and do that now, please. Okay, welcome back. So, a couple of things about what graphs can show you. Okay, so let's just say we deliberately changed one thing. So each time I would say increasing something, going up. So uh, maybe I was increasing the amount of acid that I was using in an experiment. So maybe one molar acid, two molar acid, three molar acid, four molar acid, five molar acid. And then here, how does that affect the rate or how quickly something dissolves in the acid? Okay, now this shows like one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, five minute, and so on. So graphs can show a positive correlation, which is directly proportional when using a line of best fit. What this means is changing this, the changing X seems to have affected Y. Okay, because as you can see, there does seem to be a link as X goes up it causes Y to go up, whatever that may be. Now, we would never do like a dot to dot because that's not really the best way to show the data. What we're looking for here is a general pattern. So you draw a line from zero here in the corner that goes through, through or as close to as many points as you can because what it's trying to show you is the general pattern, okay? So you kind of, kind of got to look at the graph with your eyes and make a sensible suggestion. This is called a line of best fit. It shows the general pattern. Okay, we never, never do dot to dots. Okay, we would never go eh, 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 which doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't show the general pattern, but this line of best fit does. So, once again, pause the video and please write in what a line of best fit is. Okay, welcome back. Now, a couple other things. This is an anomaly, okay? Now, an anomaly is a result that doesn't seem to fit the pattern, okay? Now, if it's an obvious outlier like this, we can simply ignore it, okay? We circle it, we still have to acknowledge that it's there, but what we might end up doing is if we use that in our line of best fit, it would pull our whole average down this way because we've got to try and make it fit this one as well. And that wouldn't really work. Okay, so what we do is we'll leave our line of best fit where it is and we'll say that that is an anomalous result. One, for whatever reason, maybe a mistake was made, that doesn't fit the pattern. Okay, now one other thing I need to show you. Firstly, uh, in a moment, you'll need to write out what an anomaly is, but when we get a straight line or a roughly straight line like this, we call that directly proportional. What that means is as X goes up by a certain amount, Y goes up by the, roughly the same amount each time. Okay, so X seems to directly influence Y. But as X goes up at the, as by a certain amount, Y goes up by the same amount each time. Okay? So, firstly, once again, pause the video and write in what is an anomaly, so it's a result that doesn't fit the pattern, which we seem to ignore, and what do we mean by directly proportional. Okay? So do that now, please. Okay, welcome back. So, graphs can tell us other things as well. So, this is called inversely proportional. Okay, now as you can see, it's a straight line, but means something slightly different. So, there's X and Y. What this means is, as our independent variable goes up, so as we deliberately change something and maybe increase it, the thing that we're measuring goes down. Okay, and it goes down by the same amount each time. Okay, so 
as x goes up, or as we increase x, y goes down by the same amount. It's still a straight line, but it's what we call inversely proportional. Okay, so once again, quickly pause the video and do that now, please. Just copy up this really quickly to show as the x, so as the independent variable goes up, the dependent variable goes down by the same amount. That's called inversely proportional. Okay, so pause the video and draw that in your books, please. Okay, welcome back. Now, sometimes we don't get any kind of pattern in our data. So maybe we do an experiment and the thing we deliberately change doesn't seem to give us any clear pattern on the thing we measure. So X and Y, it doesn't seem to be a clear link at all. And that is, those are results. We can still use that. We can say, based on my experiment, there was no clear correlation. Okay, so a couple of little things about this. Firstly, if data is continuous, what that means is if we're comparing, say, one set of numbers, which could, in theory, continue on forever, against another set of numbers, we call that continuous. And those are always represented by line graphs like this. Okay, so we plot our data points like that. And then we would draw a line of best fit. Okay, sometimes it's straight, but sometimes in science it's not. In maths, you'll always find they're straight, but in science, these are the examples that they're straight, but not always is that the case. Now, if we've got something called categoric data, we have to use a different kind of graph. We use a bar graph. Now, a bar graph is used when our independent variable the thing we're measuring is uh, our distinct categories. They're not numbers. We wouldn't say, for example, uh, this data, what is your favourite food? Well, we wouldn't say number one or number two, okay? It would be KFC, Gourmet Burger, McDonald's, Domino's, the Salad Shack, whatever, okay? So those are distinct categories, okay, because they're companies or whatever. They're not numbers. So what we do is we put those in bars like this and then so maybe 10 people like KFC, 15 people like Gourmet Burger, 8 people like McDonald's, Domino's not very popular, only two. But as you can see, okay, this is what we changed. So this is what we were looking at and this is what we measured, the number of people that liked it, okay. And so we display categoric data because it's categories in a bar chart. Okay, now I've given you all the information that you need in order to answer the sheets. So what I will do is for this first part, you can pretty much just look at this and try and make sense of it. So you can watch this lesson back if you need to. And then what I would like to do is have a go at the two skill sheets which are in assignments and then upload them. Just a word of note, you, unfortunately you can't edit them in assignments. So what you might have to do is download them, edit them your, on your own computer and then upload them. Or you can simply uh, do it in your book and then snap me a picture like that. That's absolutely fine. So good luck and I'll be online to answer your questions if you need help.